everyone will contribute. The answer is how much. Well, I guess that's where we, the, the political discussions come that, in. That, that's the thing. And the thing is, if you asked people about who actually pays the most, the highest rate of tax, people would guess that it's the very wealthy. Hi everyone, before we start, I want to take a minute to talk about my next book. You may have heard about the story of GameStop in January or February and thought it was all over. You're sadly mistaken. Unfolding Online has been a clash between the corrupt practices of Wall Street and the hive mind of the internet. It's a hot, raging information war pitting retail investors against financial giants swimming in corruption and fraud. The trailer is at the end of this podcast, but if you want to help crowdfund the book or just find out more, you can sign up to my mailing list to get access to a preview of chapter one or go to whenmoon.com to read more about the book. The first 200 people to pre-order the book will get a free pack of To The Moon crayons with their book. I just want to make a quick mention of our sponsors. Namecheap are one of the cheapest places on the internet to get a domain name for your next website. I've used Namecheap for all the sites I've ever purchased and I find it really easy to use. Spreaker are a rapidly growing platform for podcast recording, publishing and monetization with pricing plans as low as $7 per month. A cheap way to host your podcast and start earning from your back catalogue of shows. Finally, ExpressVPN is the internet's most trusted VPN. Protect your privacy and watch and view content that is location locked. You can even try watching Netflix from a different country. And right now, they're offering 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN. Please use the links in the description below if you want to support the show. Anyway. Here's the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I'm here talking with Dr. Malcolm James, author of The Glorification of Plunder. Uh, welcome to the show. I'm very pleased to be here, Josh. Fantastic. So why don't you give um, people a little background on yourself uh, so yeah, they can get, get familiar with you before we uh, dive into the, the depths of, of tax and taxation? Uh, yeah, well, I'm... Currently head of department, but at Cardiff Metropolitan University, County Department of Accounting, Economics and Finance. But for many years, I have been the tax lecturer. And I came to this as an accountant, which meant that what you do is you learn the rules and you learn to apply them so that you could go and start off doing compliance by working out somebody's tax liability and then also using those rules to advise uh, clients and now being in academia I started to get an interest in the fact that Moses did not come down off the mount with the British or indeed any other tax system carved in tablets of stone there is nothing sort of inevitable about any tax system. And what it does is it gives a window into a society because how we tax, what we tax, who we tax, how much we tax and what we do with, uh, with uh, the money. And I'll come back to the relationship between spending and tax because it's not what you might actually think gives an idea of what a country is, what a country would like to be and its values. So a good example is that I think I've given in the first chapter of my book is that when uh, Simon Rattle took over the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, he gave an interview in which he said that the city of Munich, which is somewhere around about one and a quarter million, spends more in art and music subsidies than the whole of the UK, believe it or not. And wow. when that, that, that is what he said. Uh, he didn't give any figures, I, I have to admit that. But, but the, and the other thing is that 
you know, in the 1945, when Germany was absolutely flattened, one of the first buildings that got rebuilt in any city was the Theatre Stroke Opera House. Now, that is a statement that said that Germany was back getting back on its feet. It was getting back up and running. And it's their values. It's the fact, the importance that they put on well, culture, maybe it's a culture, the sort of highbrow theatre and, and opera. So it makes a statement. And in the same way, how you tax, who you tax, what you tax, how much you tax, makes a similar sort of statement. And this is what I've been sort of very uh, interested in, is that I think some of the chapters uh, in the uh, in the book are perhaps a sort of little sort of recherche for sort of podcasts such as this. But I think there's a, there's a lot of it in about how power operates and how tax systems come to be, which sort of sheds a light on the country. And if, we, if we're looking, if we start philosophically, because I'm going to go from philosophy and then sort of get down in some time on those economics. One thing, well, I say philosophy, you'll probably hear it down the pub. Taxation is theft. How often have you heard somebody say that or something very like it? Mm. Because <laughs> what it says is, my money is mine and no one, not even the government, has any right to it. So taxation is seen as legalised confiscation. And this actually goes back to, to a philosophy, libertarianism. Now, libertarianism, I think, again, we've got to be very careful with words because obviously the, the word at the root of it is liberty. So everyone thinks, oh, great, isn't that good? And whilst liberty might, in itself might be good, libertarianism is a, a philosophy, an ideology, which is not self-evidently good. And it's a very, uh, it, it, it prioritizes the individual over society. So, and it, in some ways, it doesn't have a lot of time for d democracy because they say the state imposing tax is the state trying to override my right to keep my hard earned money. Now, you, you, you can critique this. So, for example, is that there are certain serv things that have to be provided communally. Mm -hmm. You've got to have, they can't really privatise the armed services or the police, really. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some people would argue you can. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, th I, th I think there is, there's a certain, but I think at the bottom, you know, even uh, the, uh, the, the, the died in the wool libertarians don't believe you can abolish the state. They, they might have the sort of night watchman state, the minimal state, mm. but there is a state of some uh, kind. Uh, and the, and also what it does is it actually, they, you know, but other things like education and health, they believe should be funded privately by the individual, mm -hmm. which I suppose is the is the philosophy so underlying the privatization, by well, privatization by stealth, if you want to call it that, of the NHS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels ultimately like libertarianism to me feels like the logical conclusion of the the in the hyper individualistic tendencies of western society like that's that's yeah. where it seems to go to me after, after all is that this is what you know Maggie thatcher and, and and here you know it's amazing that i'm here citing women's own but it was in women's own that maggie thatcher gave that interview where she said there is no such thing as society 
you have you owe responsibility to your families, etc. But there is not this sort of overriding concept of society. The other side is something along the lines of if I think it was just something that he liked to say. You know, the American uh, jurist and failed presidential candidate Wendell Wilkie where he said something along the lines of a taxation is the dues we pay for living in a civilized society. Hmm. So you can see it's different. It recognizes that a much more uh, collectivist ethos and the fact that if we expect society to provide things for us, then we have to be expect to pay in. You can't just sort of expect it for free, mm. because, because I suppose, and I suppose one of the things, the criticisms of libertarianism, is the free rider, because there are certain things, you know, like clean air. You can't actually just provide clean air or clean water to people who pay for it. You either provide it or you don't, and or, or like security. Uh, and if you don't, uh, people don't pay for it, they actually free ride on the backs of the people who do actually pay for it. So however attractive libertarianism may actually uh, appear, you know, it, it is a very flawed sort of philosophy. And you know, we, you know, we have to be collectiveness to a greater or le 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 lesser extent. It just it is a matter of discussing how far, how far do we want to pool our resources? Mm. What are our attitudes to things like inequality? Because it's not inevitable. I think we've we've got this very individualist in here and in and in the states, but. For, so, for example, is that this is from Denmark. Uh, this is an academic who I, I actually know uh, over in Copenhagen wrote, uh, Danes pay their taxes, if not with enthusiasm, then certainly with appreciation. Now, no one expects people really to pay tax with a song in their heart. All you really expect them is to accept that it's a legitimate civic duty just go sort of across the water you've got Sweden and the Swedish tax authority is one of the most highly regarded public institutions could you ever imagine people saying the same of the HMRC here or the IRS in the US <laughs> no I cannot I mean no. HM HMRC are not um popular but the IRS are even less popular I think yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so, uh, yeah, so I think those are maybe the sort of two competing attitudes towards tax, which actually underpin two competing attitudes towards, well, dare I say society, when the whole thing about libertarianism is there's no such thing, but I think you get my, I think you get my, uh, my meaning here. Mm, I do. It's uh, it's quite interesting, actually. I was just talking this morning to um, Mark Thomas, who is not the comedian Mark Thomas, Mark E. Thomas, the author of 99%. And he was basically laying out to me that the most prosperous period in the, basically in the history of humanity was um, that post-war period from 1945 through to 1980, which actually involved probably the highest tax rates that i can point to in in history and that turned out to be the most prosperous for everyone so it it kind of suggests that at least there is a, a very strong argument that tax is is providing something to to everyone um I, I, the the thing i really kind of wanted to ask you is do, do you believe that taxation is theft in the case where a system is not representing you because obviously that comes from the original American sort of no taxation without representation. And a lot of people sort of feel less and less represented by 
by the, the, the government who is asking for the tax. So do you think there's a point at which that stops being the case, that, that we are contributing, that, that we should contribute to something if it's no longer representing our interests, not just perhaps as an individual, but as a society as a whole? I think that what history has told us is that in these cases, tax is the one thing above all which will provoke civil discontent. You've got the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. You've got, after the Boston Tea Party, what was a revolt against unfair taxation, if unfair import duties on tea. The, uh, there were obviously a whole mixture of grievances uh, which, which sparked the French Revolution, but unfair taxation would doubtless have been one of them. 30 years ago, people were on the streets about the poll tax, and that brought about the downfall of Margaret Thatcher. So, yes, I, I can see that why tax might be theft if you're not represented, but people don't just don't just grumble. <laughs> tax, unfair taxation is more likely than just about anything else to get people onto the streets. Mm. Because ultimately, you can only tax by consent. Now, you don't uh, need, can't get consent on every last detail, but you have to have consent that the tax system is broadly fair, uh, and that you know, it, it and it broadly works for everyone. Mm. So, so you're I saying, think, yeah, I, I think this is the point: is that then people won't just grumble. They'll go on the sort of streets. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think history kind of reflects that uh, pretty pretty well. Um, so one of the arguments then that, that that the libertarians or those who lean in that direction would make um, would be that uh, the, the amount of taxation that we're taking only as you increase that, it inflates the size of the state and therefore um, the size of government, and then ultimately in their minds, the amount of waste of, of, of you know, my hard earned money. Um, do you think that the amount of tax that, pe that the government is is asking for inevitably reflects the size of the state in, in that way? Well, I think, I, I think, first of all, I think this is the point where I sort of need to sort of clarify the function of taxation within the state because it's not what you think. In actual fact, the whole idea that we have has got it basically backwards. Because the government does not have to raise a penny in taxation in order to spend money and provide uh, services. Now, why I say that is that, that this is true for a, a, a government which has its own central bank. So it's, it's the case for us, the state, China, but this is one big difference between us and say, if you remember some years ago, Greece, because they're in the Eurozone and the issuing bank is the European Central Bank. Because we have the Bank of England. And what we've got to do is, is, is not just under, we've got to understand tax as part of the overall financial system. And you, have you heard the term MMT or modern monetary theory? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, they, people try and sort of deride MM, monetary theory by saying that MMT stands for magic money tree. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, I think that there are basically two problems with the term modern monetary theory. First of all, the fact it's theory. <laughs> it's as much a theory as, as Newton's who had a theory of gravity. It's the basic, <laughs> the way it works. Basically, it, des it describes how the economy, the macroeconomy works. 
And secondly, I've, I've, I've a problem with the term modern. It is not modern. Basically, it's been around forever. It's just been their dirty little secret. Basically, that there was a magic money tree and every time they wanted to go to a war, where do you think the money for the Iraq war or wherever came from? That didn't come from tax. It was just there. It was created. Hmm. Where did the money to bail out the banks come from? Where has the money for COVID come from? And also, where did that, that money for social care or what happened when the political pressure got too much? And they said, oh, we found a bit. They didn't have a bit of money tucked away in some vault somewhere. They created it. Hmm. And a government can create as much of it as you like. It likes. And the thing is, all money comes from the government. And this is what, and so the, the argument of the government simply being an outsized, you know, uh, domestic household is completely erroneous because we don't have our own central bank, do we? Be nice. uh, no. And, and this is one, one of the problems in about how you can get people to understand it because I, I understand. It is difficult to get your head head round, but maybe uh, you've played Monopoly, haven't you? Mm -hmm. What's the first thing, pretty well, that happens before you start a game of Monopoly? Well, you've got to divvy up the initial funds. Yeah. So what you've got, if you've got a load of money in in the box, which is the bank. And, and, and they issue it to you. It's no different, really. And the thing is, we talk about monopoly money as if it was something that is unreal. It, it's sort of a byword for money which is not real. Monopoly money is basically a, a means of payment which is agreed by the players of the game. And in that part, it's not too different from the money that we have from the Bank of England. In actual fact, I suppose it is every bit as real as, say, you know, the Stroud Pound or, you know, all those local ones mm. where they are an, an agreed method of payment. The thing is, the Stroud Pound is opt-in, isn't it? Where is uh, the... Uh, the Bank of England money is, is, is legal tender. And what happens in Monopoly if the bank runs out of money? You've got to crack open the second box and find some uh, more. Well, what sort of is yeah. that it says the banker could just create it using pen and paper. Mm. So they can simply create as much money as they like. And so as can a government, they can fund whatever they like. And there are two ways of doing it because in bank accounts, if you go for a loan and, and, they, and they give you a 10,000 pound loan or what have you, all that happens is there's a bookkeeping transaction. Now, now, it's quite complicated because, of course, what it does is it gives you a right to stick your card in a hole in the wall and get some money out. Now, there has to be, there has to be enough sort of notes and coins to sort of fund the day-to-day -day requirements for cash. But if you think what's happened over in COVID, now, everyone, when you pay contactless, all it is, you know, whether it's that, chip and pin, or old-fashioned checks, what are these? When, when, when was the last time you wrote a check? Do you even have a checkbook? I Possibly. did at one point. Yeah. I have not written a check in a while. No, 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 no. I, my, my, my checkbook, I think, I, is half done. It goes back about five years. Uh, because all it is is an instruction to the bank to transfer money from your account to somebody else's account. Mm -hmm. 
And, and the government can create as much of that as they want. Now, the big problem that you've got is what's going to happen if you create loads of money? The, the big problem that people see is inflation. Mm -hmm. Now, what the government creates, it can also destroy. So what happens is that taxation is the government taking money out of the economy. So they can issue money various ways and there are a number of ways of taking money back out of the economy and taxation is one of those. And the, the big uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of bogey man that you've got is inflation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We must we must keep control of the money supply in order to prevent inflation, and that is what austerity is about. Keeping down and and also the deficit is not a, a real deficit in the way that we understand it, but I think that goes rather beyond the uh, scope of the uh, of this talk. Because you, whilst it's bad to have too much money, it's also bad to have too little. Go back to monopoly. Now, one of the simplifying assumptions, things which is not realistic, is at the start, the bank owns all the property. So when you land on Trafalgar Square or King's Cross or the electricity company, you pay the bank whatever, that takes the money out of circulation. And what would happen eventually if that the game would grind to pulp because no one have any money left? That is why you get 200 for passing go. Mm -hmm. They've got to have a mechanism for keeping enough money in the game for it to function. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that this is like a simulation of, in in a way, taxation being taking money out of the system and then uh, government spending putting it back in. Well, uh, well, I think this is no. This is where we got it sort of backwards because the okay. spending comes first. Because okay. the, the phrase tax and spend is putting the cart before the horse. It's really spend and tax, really. So this, and when, uh, because uh, the, other, the other thing that illustrates this is that there's a paper, well, it's actually a reply to a paper. It's, it's, it's about over 40 years old and it was called, it was about something called the Washington or the Capitol Hill babysitting co-op. Now, you possibly understand what, uh, sort of, uh, what, what, what this sort of organisation is, is that I don't know whether uh, no, no, you've had it for any kids, if you indeed you have any, uh, or you may have experienced it as I did as a child, because my parents were a member, in, both in, in two places, uh, of a similar sort of organisation. Basically, it's where people babysit for each other. So you've got to have a scoring system to make sure that people do their fair share of babysitting. And there are two there are two ways of so either you can have a bookkeeping system where you know, it's basically a transfer of points or whatever you call it between the person who's uh, been have been babysat for as kids are being babysat for the person who did the babysitting and the whole idea is that over a period you need to be equal uh, or you know what the this the capitol hill co-op did was that they issued what they called script basically it was their own private currency now that sounds fine, except that what they what they did 
was they, they had a system of dues. Now, dues are what we might call tax. They, they functioned in the same way as tax. So basically, once you joined the co-op, then they issued you with a certain quantity of vouchers. So once again, that's just like a central bank issuing you money. And you were expected to repay it when you left the co-op for a uh, cooperative for whatever reason. But over, over, over the year, you had to pay in, I think, probably about 14 hours into the system to for, for the admin. And of those, I think 12 hours which you paid in went to the group secretary, who was the person who administered, who matched up uh, babysitting regression. Remember, this is 1973. You didn't have any computing. It was all done by hand. And I think two hours went elsewhere. So with 150 families, what happened is they paid in 2,100 hours of babysitting system into the system by way of tax. But what they did is that they paid out a total of roughly 1,800 to four uh, group secretaries and 100 odd to some other people for whatever. There was a 200 shortfall, which meant that every year, 200 uh, hours or whatever or call it, got sucked out of the system back into the bank. And people actually needed a, f a cushion. They sort of said, well, uh, my mum's not very well. She may go into hospital. We might need it. We don't want to fritter it away by going out for, uh, you know, to the theatre or for meals, etc. So we'll try and store it up. Let's go and get some more by going and babysitting for other people. Now, possibly you can see the fundamental flaw with that is if one or two people do it, that's fine. But if everyone does it, it doesn't. It all breaks down because one person's expenditure, another person's income. You can only actually get uh, the money if somebody else wants babysitting. And if there's no demand for babysitting, the, then there's no opportunity to babysit. So you get a, so a recession or a depression because the money gets sucked out of the system. And that is what happens with austerity. Austerity is basically fiscal deflation. Hmm. Now that there was the first part. I won't go into what what, what they did to because I think they went too far. They, they, you know, they got into all sorts of problems. But also, I, I I with my students take it in a direction which was there taken by uh, the article or indeed Paul Krugman because think. What happens? You, you've got this 200 hours per year being sucked out of the system. Mm -hmm. But what happens to that 1800? So you say four, 450 hours each gets doled out to four of the group secretaries, which is somewhere in the region of 30. So these four people got 35 to 40 hours a month of babysitting time for the for, for doing the uh, doing the admin. Now, even if you don't have children, I think you can probably sort of realise the problem is how do you spend thirty five to forty eight forty hours a month? Now, first of all, these were well paid professionals. Uh, uh, well, well. Where he was, I think we, I can say that without sounding sexist. This is 1973. <laughs> I think uh, pretty most of them is probably a pr pretty traditional setup, mm -hmm. a demanding job. So when you worked late, 
then you couldn't get go out. They would still have to pay for theatre tickets and uh, and restaurant meals or whatever. People probably had their independent lives. So he went out on a Monday, leaving her to put the kids to bed. She went out on a Wednesday, leaving him to do it. So I think you get the drift is that it, it was possibly impossible for these group secretaries to spend all the babysitting time they got given. Mm -hmm. And then end of the month, in came another 35 or 40. So they were stockpiling the money, which they simply couldn't spend, even though theoretically that was in the system. So you, basically you had the paying the dues was tax mm -hmm. and giving the money to the group secretaries was the expenditure. So it was given to a few individuals who were stockpiling the money and because they couldn't spend it, it was being taken out of the system in the, almost as effectively as the 200 hours, which surplus between the tax and the expenditure. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, this wasn't a commission system. Basically, it was sort of a rentier economy here because they got the money by right, simply by having this person on their books. They still got the same money when th the activity dwindled to sort of very little because no one actually wanted to go out. They still, people still paid in the same hour or whatever a month, etc. So I think what you can see is the function in the tax has here in when it gets out of kilter the problem when you've got too little money in the system and i think obviously well people go back to say 2008 about you know, the big lie about wrecking the economy mm -hmm. but the big one goes back to the 1970s. How often have you had, you know, Labour will take us back to the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, now, do you, uh, I often ask my students, you know, 1975, what did inflation peak at, roughly? Ooh, I think it was like 15% at one point, was it? Am I wrong there? Uh, 27%. 27%, wow. I know that's it, no, that is, seems absolutely sort of unimaginable mm. to people now unless of course you happen to come from like zimbabwe when that's sort of actually sort of where we're hyperinflation yeah. uh, Weimar germany or somewhere like that yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. but that but the the blame for that was paid laid fairly and squarely at the door of labor and the unions mm -hmm. but what's very interesting is that, uh, and I, I, I came across this and I actually looked at the papers. This is an academic called Duncan Needham at Cambridge University. And he, uh, I know I, 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 can, I, can, I can send you the paper if you want about the money supply experiment, which went from sort of August, September 71, to the end of 1973, where they loosened lending restrictions because uh, I, I don't know if you're aware that in this country, only about 3% of what we know is mo of money is actually represented by notes and coins. Mm -hmm. Most of it's just Most numbers. Of it is created by bank lending. And they, they, they basically reduced the liquidity margin that banks have. So, that, so, so each pound, instead of being lent 20 times, could be lent 30 times. And the idea was, you know, they wanted to go for growth, but all, all it did was stoked and, and was inflation. Hmm. But there was this lag 
So basically, you, you had is contributed was Nixon coming off the gold standard in August seventy one, and also you probably know about the uh, the oil price crisis in late seventy three, which is political retaliation for Western countries supporting Israel in the Middle East war. Mm -hmm. So Heath um, went for an election in February 27, 1974, lost, and basically gave the incoming Labour government the proverbial hospital pass. Uh, uh, so, I, I, but, but you, you never hear about that. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't. Like, I was, I, I was actually discussing, like, this very period with um, Mark Thomas there this morning, and he was, no, he was noting, actually, that Whilst inflation um, was in, at some points wildly out of control, that the growth overall in the economy was far better then in that decade than it was over the last ten years, and that uh, the, so so I, I'm learning a lot about the seventies today. <laughs> right. So okay. So and I know I, I've been talking maybe more about economics, but I I, I trust that you sort of uh, understand how tax fits in here. Mm -hmm. uh, both as the fact the danger of the, the danger of say austerity where you cause a depression and also of, of the money supply running out of control mm -hmm. now, let me can, can I just define can I just like make sure that I understand what you're saying here and, and just sort of try and clarify it before we, we move on so basically you're saying that tax is a way to find the the balance in um the, the the amount of money in in circulation so it's either um you're either you're trying to find the balance between taxing too much and taking too much money out of the system um as or, or not spending enough and es essentially creating the same effect or yeah. you're cr either printing a lot or allowing banks to create a lot of money through uh, things like fractional reserve banking and the, the 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 sort of things that you described there. And what we want to do ideally is find like a, a nice middle ground where there's a good supply of money, but it's not running out of control, but it's also yeah. not sucking too much out of it. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Because because yeah, that's correct. Because I think what determines it is that here I'm speaking as an accountant. When when you talk about budgeting. Then you, you t the first thing, you, there's a limiting factor, which is an overriding constraint, which determines all the other bits of the budget. So it may be demand, what you think you can sell, or it may be availability of labor. Because you know, there, no, there is no point in, in budgeting to make and sell what you can't make, can't get the materials or the labor for. Mm -hmm. Now, what this means, money is never the limiting factor because we can create as much of it as we want. But the thing is, as you loosen a limiting factor, there comes a point where it ceases to be the limiting factor. Something else becomes the limiting factor. So the, so the limiting factors are in the real economy, they're things like availability of, of labor, availability of you know, machinery and infrastructure, availability of materials. So creating more money is, is not a problem provided that it uh, releases you know, pent up uh, potential of the economy. But uh, at a certain point, you're going to hit some other limiting factor or other, and any more money will not uh, sort of in, in, uh, expand the economy, it will just lead to inflation. So basically, you've got to hit that sweet spot. Okay. Now, to come round about sort of taxation, uh, uh, I've, I've probably taken a very, very long time to get here, but I hope it's been That's an right. interesting journey. Uh, bec because tax follows spending, so we need to look about how much the government spends 
which dis- which actually determines the size of the state, and what the government spends determines what the government needs to take back out of the economy to keep it in balance. So I think we need to understand you know, the fact that spending always comes before taxation. Mm. But then it's very much a matter of not just how much we spend, but what we spend it on. And with tax, who we tax and what we tax. Uh, and, in, and it's interesting that what happened in the 1970s, uh, it, you know, we, we, we may have sort of reduced sort of uh, consumer inflation, but what we had was uh, asset price inflation. Now, property principally, now you probably, I think, you know, the, the RPI uh, over the last 50 years has probably gone up 13 and 13, 14 times, something like that. That's a lot. That's the retail price index, right? Uh, the retail price index. But if you think about property, uh, 1971, uh, my parents moved back down to near London and bought a nice house with a nice big garden, uh, sort of in Hart, South Hertfordshire, just south of what is uh, of the M25, although the M25 wasn't there then. 13,500. That's you, disgusting. Well, well, well <laughs> I know that. Just saw the cat. The, the the sheet from the estate agent and show oh, really? some decades later. Okay, they spent some money on it. If you go onto Tupla or somewhere and, and type in the postcode for it now and find it, it's worth somewhere in the region of one and a half million. Oh my goodness, that is disgusting. So you could <laughs> so, so you've got I know the asset for, and and also uh and this is in the book by what, what was his name? He's uh, why you won't get rich. I'm just trying to think. He wrote another uh, book, uh, and, and he did much the same sort of thing about 1971. About a father took a family to the cup final, paid a pound for the tickets. Now inflation adjusted about thirteen pounds fifty. Now the cheapest ticket now is forty five quid. They paid about well equivalent of about twelve p or something for a pint of beer. Okay, it was probably some disgusting cake fizz, but it was beer. Uh, as, as you can see, I've got, I'm have got i a member of camera. So right. I, uh, uh, but then if you think the price of a pint, so you can see that some, uh, there's some uh, inflation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so we've had sort of a lot of sort of the asset price inflation hmm. uh which, which is by by lending because of course the supply of property is fairly fixed in the short term so if you lend more all that happens is property prices are going to go up mm-hmm. and, yeah. and is that is largely what has happened hmm. yeah yeah really um i mean is that is that a bad thing? Do we want to encourage people to have property? Um, I mean, that, yeah, that, that's very speculative. But... Is, is, is that the thing is, it now, you know, people, no, no, I'm lucky. I've got a house here. It, it's not, it's not particularly big. It's not particularly grand, but it's, pay, it's mine. <laughs> uh, no, it's paid for. And no, I, it's gone up since I, I, I moved in. It's gone up in, in real terms. I don't know, twice to two and a half times. Wow. So basically, I'm still of the generation which got onto that. You, no, you, I don't know what part of the country you're broadcasting from, whether it's London or South. From Bel- Belfast at the minute. Oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh, oh yes. I, I, I identified, no, your accent, but, uh, uh, but I didn't know where you were, where you were based. Yes, I'm at home. Uh, right. <laughs> so, but then, but then I, I suppose then Belfast has had his own, so shall we say, unique set of, political circumstances over the last 50 years, hasn't it? Yes. But I yeah. think, you know, you can imagine that if you're London, the South East, people of your age just can't get on the property ladder. Mm. And the people who did manage to get on it 
were, you know, have done very nicely out of it indeed. I've done pretty nicely out of it. I recognise that, but I don't kid myself that it's part that is, is, is due to my my hard work and ability. I was just happened to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, but, yes, um, I wanted to ask mainly, like, and we mentioned this at the start. Actually, I wanted to sort of talk about about what what, what a tax system says about a nation and what it says more more specifically than about Britain. Because uh, I mean, obviously, there's there's competing views that we've we've discussed and laid out earlier in the in the in the recording where we've talked about um, you know how much how much tax is is you know moral or how much should we tax that we've sort of touched on those libertarian issues. But like, what do you think of the like the the taxation system says about a country? Like, what does what does that suggest to people about and about Britain? Well, it it tells us where our values lie. Because it's what we're prepared to fund, what we're not prepared to fund, and who we expect to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to what I said about you know, theatre and opera in Germany. They're prepared to fund it. It's the fact of historical reasons that every... You know, I, I lived one time in Germany in a place called Mainz, which is the capital of uh, uh, Rheinland-Pfalz, it's about mm, 200,000, had its own theatre and opera house. Wiesbaden, only a few miles across the river, a bit bigger, about 250, 300,000, similarly had a theatre and opera house. 25 miles away, you had the big one in Frankfurt, and somewhere you also had Darmstadt. Okay, that was fairly uh, exceptional, even by German standards, but you get the idea, is that the idea that you know, every, you know, every medium-sized town has its own theatre and opera house is quite unthinkable here. Mm. So, it, 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 you know, it does actually show about sort of values. Uh, and, and, the, and, and the whole, I, and, and, but the thing is, I think sometimes values can be explicit and sometimes it has to be covert because I think... If you go to Scandinavia, what they fund and how they tax it is probably you know, fair, fairly open because it, it redistributes, it's a collective ethos and it redistributes from the wealthier people, not that there are too many really, really wealthy people in this country, in those countries, there's, a, there's, a, there's much less uh, extremes of wealth in, in there. And of course, we like it after all. If you if you go to Copenhagen or Stockholm, you come back and say, "Isn't it lovely?" <laughs> yeah. The thing is, the Danes, Swedes, Finns, or whoever don't do anything that we couldn't, and they do an awful lot of things that we used to do. Mm. So, because if you look at uh, an inequality, uh, are you aware of something called the Gini coefficient? Mm -hmm which is a measure of inequality. So uh, a G, it's a number between zero and one. So zero is absolute equality. Everyone has exactly the same income and, and wealth. One is one person has all the money and wealth. Mm -hmm. So obviously the, heart, the closer you are to one, the more unequal you are. And in the 1970s, we were about 0.26. And that's sort of still roughly where some of the Scandinavian countries are. We're now up at 0.34. So there's quite been quite a big increase in inequality. But if you try and favour the rich, you've got to do it covertly. So, for example, uh, I think this is this from the Telegraph. Is the top one percent pay thirty percent of income tax? Yes, I'm aware of this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the basic thing is, we're paying enough. We're pulling our weight. Don't ask us for any more. Mm -hmm. But there are two two problems. Uh, it, it's sort of like the half truth, because it's true as far as it goes, but it's what is not stated. First of all is 
What proportion of the pre-tax income goes to that top 1%? What is the level of pre-tax inequality? Uh, and secondly, they're just talking about income tax because the tax system is much broader than simply income tax. And uh, what I, I know in various sort of assignments, try and look at the income tax and uh, the tax system in a more critical way by, by, by students. And one of the things is, and also look at a sort of reasonably high level, don't get bogged down every single change in every single budget, but there's been a shift between taxes on income and taxes on expenditure. So you, you mentioned the very high uh, rates of income tax throughout the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. They were tolerated because there was a lot of growth and people were getting more prosperous despite that. And it's also the collective is ethos came out of, I think, the experience of World War Two, the shared experience. Yeah, I think, uh, and also that the, the, the different sort of classes met, and and there's some sort of understanding and empathy which has now got lost now that they are all sort of siloed, mm. and. The, so people sort of, there's a strong commitment to paying these very high rates of tax. But then what did Thatcher do? Mainly in the, in the 80s, the top rate went from 83% down to 40% over a 10 year period. And one of the first things she did was increase VAT from 8% to 15%, and it's now gone up to 20%. Mm. Because these are, these are figures from a, something like 15 years ago, but I don't think they've significantly changed. That if you uh, divide the so uh, society into 10 income deciles, the bottom decile, when you take everything into account, pays an average rate of tax of 46%. Whoa. And all the other ones, it's broadly flat. It's somewhere between 30 and 34%. But why do, does the bottom decile pay so much? First of all, expenditure taxes. That if you think about it, despite the zero rating for things like food and various other necessities, VAT is a regressive tax. Because, no the poorer people spend a much higher a proportion of their income than wealthier people. Mm. Also, council tax. So all these other things, that if, if you look at the breakdown of that 46% and then look at the sort of breakdown of the 32% or whatever, high up, you'll see that it's a very different breakdown. Mm. They may pay a low, much less in, in income tax, but they pay a lot, lot more in various other taxes. Mm. So I think you've got to be very careful with that. And what we, we've seen is e even during the pandemic, a huge transfer of uh, wealth to, towards you know, the 1% or even the 0.1%. I think it's eight trillion dollars have gone from the bottom to the top, over like yeah. globally. Yeah, but this is the thing. This is you no. Know, if you if you're going to do that, it's got to really be done covertly. Yeah, I don't think it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, but the the story you're describing here, where the, the where the bottom are paying a higher portion of tax of their income, is is like. Do you know the thing that springs to mind? And I I don't even know if it's in the Bible or if it's like a parable or something. But it's the story where there's the the poor woman who goes up to the, the the like poor box or or some sort of like donation box in the church and like gives her like last pennies and then these wealthy people come along and, and they they give like like loads of money but they still have loads left and i think it's jesus says you know who's given more 
who has contributed more and this is the well the, the person who gave everything they had um and that, do you and i hadn't planned to ask you about this but it's just sprung into my head uh, do you uh, i've seen a few proposals about the idea to kind of alleviate this problem by shifting towards uh primarily a land value tax um across uh, across the board and use that as almost the primary method of taxation rather than things like vat or corporation tax or or whatnot is that is that something that you think would help i suppose i suppose yes it could help i think the i think one of the problems with taxes on property is that you can be doing it on unrealizing you can have these very rich people who buy these mansions but you've also got say the uh uh people living in islington say who bought their houses pretty cheaply and just lived there 50 years, grown up there, and watched them shoot up in value. And you've got the pensioner asking the pensioner to pay more because it's, it's, an, it's unrealized. This is the problem. When you're okay. asking people to pay tax on a, 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 on a value which is unrealized and which you can't really realize. So I think that is possibly... So you've got to, to you at the least have to design it very carefully to make sure that uh, you, you you only taxed the sorts of people that you wanted to tax and who would actually afford to pay. Should we tax everyone? Like, do, uh, do, is there like a portion of society that doesn't need to contribute? Well, I suppose you know if you if you take the ability to pay principle. Then, if you can't afford to pay, if you don't have anything, then you can't really pay. This was the big, one of the big things about the poll tax, wasn't it? Everyone uses services, everyone ought to pay. Mm -hmm. And it was hugely regressive because basically the poll, basically it was paid on a, on a, a headcount basis, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So somebody living in a council house or a social uh, social housing paid as much as a millionaire. So now, obviously, yeah, the other thing that everyone pays, rich or poor, is VAT, because everyone is going to sort of pay uh, by stuff which which is standard rated. So. When you say, should everyone contribute? I suppose, yes. Given the fact you're going to have a variety of taxes, everyone will contribute. The answer is how much? Mm. Well, I guess that's where we, the, the political discussions come that, from. That, that's the thing. And as you can see, is that then from the figures that I actually gave, uh, with the 46%, it sh shows that it seems at the moment, you no, know, for what most people, it's sort of way out of kilter. And the and the thing is, people don't actually realise this. Mm. I think the thing is, if you asked people about who actually pays the most, the highest rate of tax, people would guess that it's the very wealthy. Mm. And... Well, I suppose part of it is the. I would have guessed the middle class, actually, or maybe the or maybe the middle classes, mm -hmm. because I, I, after the other example I, I I give is with the repayment of student loans. Is I, I don't know, uh, you know when you went through the university system a good deal more recently than I did. I would I would imagine. Uh, I mean, but, that's not, well, I, I was lucky enough to get. In, in Northern Ireland, they fought very hard to keep it at three and a half thousand a year for students coming from Northern Ireland in Northern Ireland. So I was very lucky to get to go to, to Russell Group uh, Uni for that just because it was around that time. Like if I'd gone to England, I would have paid three times the, as much. Um, so I, I'm, I'm lucky to have escaped that actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Be uh, because I say, uh, I, I give sort of three people Somebody goes off, sort of works for charities and voluntary organisation, has a career break, come, works part time, and before you know where they're out, they're fifty-two, and it gets written off. 
B becomes a teacher. C goes and works for Goldman Sachs. For whom? And, and then, and then, uh, and then, I, and then, as an afterthought, I actually say that D has very rich parents. Uh, so I think you can see the difference is that A will scarcely pay anything mm. in uh, in repayment, and it all gets written off. B is the uh, the uh, sort of great heaviest burden because. As a teacher, or maybe an accountant in a local firm, you're paying enough to for it to be a substantial burden, but you're never going to pay more. All you're doing is the, the best trending water. Whereas if you're Goldman Sachs, first decent bonus, you go to the student loan company, say, how much do I owe you? There you are. <laughs> Done. Okay, and, 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 and of course, that it's the uh, if, if you've got very wealthy parents, then you you don't have to take out student loans at all. It, it, you just so uh, yeah. I think that people wouldn't guess that it's the poorest people in society who pay the highest rate of tax. Yeah, that's a, it's a pretty shocking statistic. Actually, I wasn't aware it was it was quite as, as skewed as that. Um, now. The, the last thing I, I kind of want to ask you, because we've shot past the R here, it's fascinating, so I just uh, definitely want to get this last question in, um, is that how, how do you think we should tax? Because the, the kind of debate that goes on, at least, is that, um, or the, the, the theory that I've had explained to me, at least, now you could tell me this is wrong, maybe it is, is that we want to tax to um, discourage the behaviour we don't want and like not tax to encourage the behavior we do so we like give tax breaks or whatnot like, is that something you buy into or do you think we should sort of leave that sort of social engineering out of it and attempt to just get well, people to pay fairly well i think it's fairly. Uh, yeah. there's certain things we all want after all i think you know, for, for example i think people have grown up sort of not sort of really liking smoking most people i think if you actually go to other countries where they they still smoke heavily you really notice it mm -hmm. and the first thing i noticed that was well, i was actually was on holiday in southern ireland which instituted the smoking ban and i'd only been there earlier than they did over here i came back was and was in fishguard for uh, went into a pub and I'd only been away two weeks, and I sat down, smoke, and it immediately hit me in a way that it didn't. And then a few months later, when Wales, because I'm in South Wales, banned smoking before England did, I went up to London and I noticed it again. How do you try and stop people smoking? How do people try and do excess? And also climate change, you know, fossil fuels, all the other green initiatives, how do you, you either try and encourage or discourage or you have to ban or mandate? So, and, and really, I think people would pref prefer the sort of the nudge thing through taxation. Mm -hmm. So I think you do, but then I think, uh, but then some, when you think what we incentivize or discourage, I think, yeah, can actually sort of come to uh, be a bit of a rationalizing discourse like the incentivization to, to uh, say you, you've got to cut tax to incentivize high earners to uh, uh, to work mm -hmm. there is actually very limited evidence for that and also people tend not to look at absolutes, they look at comparative ones. You, you doubtless still heard of Ashley Cole, haven't you? Mm -hmm. uh, and have you have you heard about his autobiography published about? 50 I, I haven't actually. I mean, I, I might, I may have done many years. Ago. Well, well, well. No, I, I must admit, I haven't sat down and read it. And probably for the most, it's probably as formulaic and uh, as pretty well any other footballers autobiography but there was one passage 
which what became sort of fairly notorious about when he wanted to ask to leave what destroyed his relationship with Arsenal. He was on 35,000 a week. And new contract negotiations, he wanted 60,000 a week, Arsenal offered 55,000 a week. Now, if you think that both of those, you know, one slightly under 3 million a year, the other's over, uh, slightly over 3 million a year. And that, and then he's saying that when the, he was on the North Circular, when his agent uh, sort of rang through, said the best they're going to offer is 55,000 a week. He was so apoplectic, he almost crashed his car. Uh, yeah, no, 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 you, you can find that. And, uh, but the thing is, money was a proxy for status. Mm. Basically, he measured his, how does a footballer measure his worth within mm. a club? Basically, there are two, what they'll pay you and the transfer fee that you'll demand. And you benchmark yourself, it's relative. And also the idea is that tax can only really incentivize if it's performance related. Well, or, 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 or and, and tax is not performance related. Basically, it's a percentage, isn't it? Mm. But it's become, a, it's basically become a rationalizing discourse for paying the top people ever more. Mm. And, and also what's interesting is that what's happened to savings, because when we talk about the legendarily high tax rates of the 1970s, that the 83% was the top rate for earned income. But on top of that, you had a, a, a 15% investment income surcharge. So it was 98% on passive income. Hmm. Nowadays, we want to, we have preferential uh, rates for saving because we say saving is a good thing so again I think that yes I think the tax system is always going to be used for to encourage and discourage and it's probably better than a lot of the alternatives but I think also you've got to look at very critically at what you encourage and what you discourage and and the fact there can be a sort of fairly hid, uh, well, I say a hidden, or maybe you might say not so hidden, <coughs> agenda. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, what's it? The Beatles, the Beatles even wrote a sort of tax man because <laughs> I think they were paying essentially, yeah, ninety eight percent tax, and George Harrison wasn't particularly happy that his millions were were being sent straight to Her Majesty's government. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, Malcolm, uh, I have taken up a lot of your time and it has been a pleasure, um, incredibly educational. Actually, I've learned a lot that I did not expect to learn. Um, if you would send me that paper, actually, that you mentioned by by Duncan Meaden, that would be great. I will put that in the in the description below and the Capitol Hill babysitting co-op thing, if I can find it. As well. I'll send you that. It, I must admit, it, it was short, but I think the, lack, the way it's written is not particularly... <laughs> accessible i think it's one problem when i show it to my students i think the language does turn them off so i'll send it and also i will send you the some of the comments that i put up on uh, on the the virtual the learning site uh, on moodle okay and and, and 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 i'll also send you i've also from the internet took out that that, that passage on ashley cole uh so uh because you, you really probably don't want to read the whole book, uh, but, but, but this, but this is, but this is just it's, a, it's about a page, it's about a page and a half on Word. Mm, that sounds great, actually. If you, oh, so that, I'll, yeah. I'll send you that stuff this evening. Yes, so I will find uh, links for everything. I will put in the description below to to um, some of your work as well and um, everything else that I can find that I will that I believe will be useful and interesting to people. Um, listening to the conversation so um, yeah and if uh, you would just hang around for like two minutes after so we can make sure everything has recorded and, and sort of set up all right um, okay. but yes thanks very much for your time okay it's, it's absolutely wonderful to speak to you as I've thoroughly enjoyed doing this thanks for making it all the way to the end of the podcast don't forget our sponsor ExpressVPN and my book Brexit the Establishment Civil War can both be found in the links in the description below and also, please like, share and subscribe to this podcast. It's the best way to help us grow. Until next time, thanks for listening.
the animal dragged a child around its enclosure. The child had fallen into that enclosure. Officials are now defending their actions. ABC's Alex. A few things I am not. I'm not a cat. I am not an institutional investor, nor am I a hedge fund. There's no panic selling. These people, you know, they may have bought at $4, sat through $400, went back to 40, went to 350, back down to 110, and they have not sold. All they've done is bought more. And there's no answer for that. There's no, they, they, you know, it, it is like art of war mastery by a bunch of idiots who should know better. And they're just, they're just like, I'm not fucking leaving. Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars let me see what spring is like on jupiter and mars what's been happening on reddit and in social media and in the marketplace has never been seen before uh, the short 70 60 80 percent of a company let alone 140 percent i think a lot of people universally believe something is wrong there they're powerful they want to stock higher it's child's play why ever sell into the maw of Wall Street, you know, Reddit bets? Why, why, why? But everyone's wrong. It's like the big short again. Or more like the big short squeeze this time, right? So here we got the fox guarding the hen house. And one of the hens is complaining, the fox is out to kill us. And the farmer says, I'm sorry, the fox is in charge of the hen house. Whenever there is not billions, but like trillions of dollars involved in something, it, I, I argue that nothing is off the table. The way they have absolutely cheated, stolen, robbed everyday people so all our hedge fund billionaire friends can get out and not get killed is one of the most remarkable, illegal, shocking robberies in the history, in plain sight. Super Stonk and the other communities that have emerged are a hive mind, the likes of which we have never seen before. It's madness and brilliance, insanity and genius all rolled into one. It's very possible that Citadel will be gone in a few months. And, and not just Citadel, but the entire financial system has the potential to come crashing down. These crooks continue to gamble recklessly with the world economy and this could be the moment that they finally get their justice. You've got maybe 10 million people doing this who now own, you know, probably more than 100 million shares and eventually, you know, they might own everything.